So hi everyone, well, welcome to this session on uh, science in cloud native. Uh, my name is Ricardo Rocha, I'm a computing engineer at CERN. Uh, today I will talk to you about uh, the usage of cloud native projects in the scientific area and uh, give you an overview of the status of this, but also the challenges that are still existing uh, in terms of using the, this type of software in for science. I'll start by giving you an overview of the status of the usage uh, in this area. So cloud native is really fastly changing the, the way scientific infrastructure is built and maintained. There are a couple of areas where this is uh, really already very significant. Uh, the first one I would highlight is uh, reproducibility. Uh, so the fact that uh, container is a very well-defined unit that can be easily deployed in different environments also helps a lot with reproducibility, which is uh, uh, key for, for science. So the fact that we can uh, take an existing component, um, even an old component, and deploy it in a current or, say, a more modern infrastructure that will come up in 10 years, this is really making a huge impact in terms of uh, of uh, redoing uh, old analysis and making sure that things can be taken forward uh, in the future. Uh, the second part is this idea again of uh, having um, uh, a container being built once using a well-defined uh, way uh, and being able to run it anywhere in different platforms. So uh, in scientific infrastructure is very often uh, heterogeneous. Uh, scientists will try to use as much as uh, uh, infrastructure as it's available to them and this means uh, having to comply with different systems underneath. So the idea that uh, people are standardizing in, uh, in containers and container orchestration APIs really means that, uh, that this task is, uh, is being simplified for, for end users. And finally, which is also related to what we just talked, once you have this single unit where you have wrapped your code and data, then sharing these units with your colleagues is much easier. Uh, this means, uh, this is something that is really, of course, uh, key to scientific collaboration, the fact that you can have your analysis and share it easily for your colleagues to reproduce. Um, so the, all of this together uh, means that the infrastructure itself is uh, very much simplified. And by doing this and having access to these tools, uh, scientists can spend a lot more time doing actual science than maintaining the underlying infrastructure. Um, one of the things that is also coming out of this is the access to a much larger set of uh, resources thanks to these standardized APIs around uh, uh, cloud native tools. There are still, of course, a few challenges, and I will highlight three today. Uh, the first one is software distribution. Uh, when, when we start thinking that the scientific workloads are made of uh, uh, thousands or tens of thousands of individual pieces, uh, pushing the software to, to where, where the analysis is going to be done is key and doing this in efficient manner, manner is of course key. Uh, the second one is uh, rootless environments. Um, a lot of the infrastructure scientists have access to uh, has uh, a very um, strict policies in terms of uh, what and how people are able to run their workloads. These are shared environments, so running them in unprivileged is a requirement. And third is the advanced scheduling. This is where the biggest differences towards uh, compared to traditional IT happen uh, when you're doing scientific workloads. And this is uh, things like batch-like batch, uh, batch -like workloads where uh, queuing and priorities and uh, fair share are very important. I'll cover a bit more of that as well. So starting with uh, software distribution, so ideally uh, container images will be very well layered and uh, optimized. Uh, having images that are over 10 gigabytes and not really well layered is really not uncommon in the, in the scientific field. Uh, in reality, even images like that are, for example, 15 or 20 gigabytes in total, uh, the actual workload will require less than 6% of that uh, to, to, to run properly. So they, it's very inefficient to have to download the full image before starting a workload. Um, if you think that uh, these clusters can be huge, uh, hundreds or t uh, thousands of nodes, uh, then this problem is even uh, bigger. You need to pull the images uh, across all the, the um, the nodes, if the images are very large, this imposes a huge pressure in terms of network and storage. 
Um, if you think that in addition, uh, you're running thousands or tens of thousands of parallel jobs, uh, this problem is even made worse. To help with this, uh, as I mentioned, the ideal would be to have optimized images. This is not always a, a, a possibility. The second one is caching, and this is particularly important if you, are, if you have geographically distributed uh, uh, clusters or nodes in your cluster. Uh, this will help a lot in with efficiency and of course peer-to-peer -peer distribution for offline distribution of the software is also a uh, key but one thing that really helps is this concept of lazy pulling this is the idea that instead of downloading the full image before deploying your workload uh, you will instead do kind of a remote mount of the image and gradually uh, download uh, only the content that is actually required and requested by the workload uh, after the container is running. So this means that uh, you could have a flat startup time of your container and then access the actual container image contents uh, as the, the workload requests it. Uh, one example of an implementation of this is this uh, remote snapshot in container D. Uh, this uh, uses a concept called seekable tar. Um, which basically, if you know how a Docker image works underneath, it's pretty much a, a, a set of tarballs, each one for, for each layer in the image. Uh, but one, one smart uh, concept uh, that is used here is that a tar of tars, it's still a valid tar. So it's fully backwards compatible with the existing uh, container image formats. But by doing a tar of tar, you end up with a seekable tar. Um, so you can basically navigate the tar to find, for example, individual files that are being requested by the workload. And this is pretty much how it happens. Uh, the, the, um, the runtime will, instead of downloading the, the, the image before launching the workload, the container will launch the container and expect that the, the data will be made available when needed. In terms of performance, this is... Uh, has a dramatic impact. Uh, you can see pretty much flat um, the startup time, no matter the image you're using. In these cases, it's actually pretty small images, but if you if you extrapolate this to images of 15 or 20 gigabytes, uh, the startup time will be very similar. Of course, then the, the, the workloads can be a bit slower as they request the data, but considering we are only requesting a very sh a small amount of the total data, there's a very big, impact in terms of uh, reduced network pressure and storage needed on the nodes as well. The second challenge uh, I mentioned earlier is this idea of uh, rootless environments. And this is particularly important for uh, high performance computing clusters. Um, a lot of the scientific uh, workloads are deployed using these massive supercomputers, which are shared uh, machines between multiple end users. So there's uh, very much restricted access uh, uh, on what uh, the end users can do in this in this um, environment. Uh, this is not a good fit for the way Kubernetes uh, and uh, other projects around it are are. Uh, built today and the expectations they have, but there is this effort to have uh, what's called rootless com containers. And uh, this is a possibility of helping to onboard more of these resources into this uh, ecosystem. Uh, so a link here uh, to the project. Um, the goal is really to manage containers as an unprivileged user. And here is not running the container, only the container itself unprivileged, but to run the container runtime as well unprivileged. And this will really uh, lower the barrier of onboarding HPC environments into uh, cloud native uh, deployments. Um, they have a very nice definition of what an unprivileged user is. It's a user that is not in the good graces of the administrator, which is a very nice definition uh, of uh, what we expect here. There is support already uh, for this kind of uh, deployment in Docker, Podman, BuildKit, ContainerD. So there's already quite a lot of things that can be done uh, using these projects. Uh, having support in ContainerD also means that um, tools like Kind, Minikube, and uh, Kubernetes using a distribution called UserNetis, as well as K3S, K3S are already an option to, to, to try out this type of workloads. 
Finally, I will mention the third challenge, uh, which is advanced scheduling. And this is really, again, the key of uh, the differences towards uh, compared to traditional IT deployments. Um, these are features that are really requirement, uh, required for traditional HPC or HTC high throughput computing type of workloads. Um, I'll mention here priority queues. Uh, this is the idea that um, as you want to maximize the usage of the clusters, you're actually allowing workloads to be queued uh, before me being submitted. And these queues have priorities for um, higher and lower priority workloads. Uh, this is also meaning that there is a requirement for preempting uh, running workloads to replace them with higher priority ones, since these workloads can take uh, a few hours or even a few days. Um, this is something that is not existing in the built-in schedulers, but there are multiple projects that are focusing on this. The second requirement is fair share. This is the notion that uh, um, you want to optimize again the usage of the, the cluster. So you allow some uh, teams or users to have um, more workloads running than what their usual quota would be uh, if other users are not using uh, completely their own quota. But over time, this should compensate. So you want to balance uh, uh, this uh, for everyone to have what their expected quota should be in a longer period of, of, of time. The third requirement is gang scheduling. This is the idea of submitting uh, multiple jobs at the same time. This is critical for, for uh, uh, workloads like MPI, where you need communication between the different pieces. Uh, so you need to be able to schedule multiple workloads at the exact same time, uh, otherwise they wouldn't run properly. This is also something that has to be been built in the scheduler. Uh, the last one I will mention is, again, uh, we talked about um, workload distribution in multiple heterogeneous environments. Uh, another requirement is to do this across multiple clusters. Again, the goal is always to maximize uh, the access to whatever resources are available. Multi-cluster is one of them, of course. So there are some projects that are really putting an effort into providing this in, in our ecosystem. Uh, the first one I'll mention is Volcano. Uh, it's the cloud native uh, batch system, and it really tries to offer all the functionality from a traditional batch system, but using cloud native uh, APIs and tools. The second one is Admiralty, and here the focus is more on the multi-cluster part, and they do this by having uh, this notion of proxy proxy pods on a top level cluster that then have the actual uh, workload pods running on child clusters. Uh, the third one is Armada, and this is again focusing on batch workloads, and uh, they focus on scheduling and running of these workloads specifically on Kubernetes. And finally, I'll mention the virtual kubelet. Uh, this is kind of masquerading the kubelet or the node in a Kubernetes cluster uh, from the actual resources uh, that serve uh, the node. And in reality, this can be uh, an actual node, but it can also be a remote API, including uh, the API of an external Kubernetes cluster or a serverless platform. So all of this together uh, really tries to, to, to make these goals of uh, improving the access to, to all types of resources to, to scientists um, in using the, the concepts that scientists are already used to. There's a lot more going on. One of the really promising developments comes also from SIG scheduling, where they try to onboard all of these concepts into the Kubernetes scheduler. Uh, and this is something that uh, will be um, evolving fast and uh, really looking forward to see uh, progress there. So um, this comes to the end of my uh, talk today. Um, I hope I gave an overview of the, what the excitement uh, towards cloud native uh, in the science area is and uh, what the challenges that still exist are as well. Uh, a lot of this uh, discussion happens in groups like the CNCF research user group, and I put here the link. And also these projects uh, uh, fall under the technical advisory group uh, tag runtime in the CNCF. So this is also where a lot of the discussion happens. So I hope this is only a teaser and I look forward to KubeCon in May uh, in Valencia with a, a lot more news in this area. And for everyone listening, enjoy KubeCon China and uh, hope to see you all soon.